Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. Our next uh, reader is Rachel Guido DeVries, and Rachel is the fiction editor of Icon, and she's also the co-founder and director of the Communi Community Writers Project in Syracuse, New York. She's also the poet in residence at Central New York psych Psychiatric Facility, where she teaches convicted felons. Her poetry and short stories have appeared in uh, many small magazines including Yellow Silk, uh, Fell Swoop, and, and is forthcoming in uh, Voices in Italian Americana. Um, I want to say that I first read Rachel, De Rachel uh, DeBree's work about 10 years ago, I think, and uh, I, I think that I, she sent me poems for my magazine, I believe. And um, I, I would really love the poems and, and wrote back to her right away. And, uh, since then, I've read other work of hers, and including a novel of hers called Tender Warriors, which is available outside. And I've always been deeply impressed by the moving quality of Rachel's work. I, I have to say that in reading Tender Warriors, I got to about page 50, and I began to cry. And I cried all the way through to the end of the book. As I was reading it, I sat there. I was up all night reading her book and, and saying, this is so wonderful. Uh, so I hope you'll at least glance at her book outside and the work of the other poets. And let's welcome Rachel Leo DeVries. I, I, uh, I want to just remind you of something. When you wrote the, read the book, I wrote the book, you wrote the letter. Um, I don't know if you remember the letter you sent me, but um, as you're talking about it, uh, about Tender Warriors and the way it uh, made you cry, you may recall that you sent me a letter that you ripped out of a piece of loose leaf paper. Yeah, it was my, like... My letters are always... <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. I thought this woman has really, like, on the, on the spot wrote this letter and uh, it, looked, uh, it looked like you meant it. So I'm really glad to be here for a number of reasons. It's, uh, Patterson is my birthplace. I was uh, born in uh, Barnard Hospital, which I don't think is in existence any longer. Um, is it still there? Um, and I went to nursing school at St. Joe's. Um, my first boss is here, Lynn McBride. My cousins are here tonight. First time my family, any members of my family have ever heard me read. So coming to do this particular reading uh, has a lot of meaning for me and I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I also want to make a point of uh, thanking not just Maria and the college, but the New Jersey State Arts Council. And I guess I also want to make a pitch uh, for all of you to think about the fact that we are now existing in a time when uh, all of our voices are deeply threatened and if you care about events like this, um, I urge all of you to contact your local representatives in terms of what's happening with the National Endowment for the Arts. Letters uh, for the abolition of the National Endowment, and I think you all should be aware of this if you're not already, are running 400 to 1 for abolition. In other words, 400 out of 401 Americans, 400 Americans are uh, contacting the representatives advocating the end of the National Endowment for the Arts. And certainly that will have the kind of effect eventually which would also um, hit things like the New Jersey Arts Council. And I think in terms of the poem Craig ended on um, and talking about poets uh, in other countries whose voices are threatened, I think we can safely say now that the voices of American artists and poets are similarly threatened. So I ask you please to be aware of that. On that note, I'm going to open with a poem for uh, a very dear friend of mine who died on Easter Sunday of AIDS. Um, his name was and is Gregory Kalavakis. Uh, he was the director of the literature panel of the National Endowment of the uh, New York State Arts Council. And um, it's someone who I think has affected the life of any artist living in the metropolitan area uh, and certainly deeply affected mine. And so this is a poem for Gregory. I just missed killing the squirrel today and thought of you now passed away. A cloud, you'd point and say the word in Greek or dream, you'd say, and float then through the rooms, waif-like, perfect to gaze upon. No apparition, though. You wrote from the west of death upon death on the snowy road in the deep mountains, from that place inside each of us where the road begins to wind so clearly down, away, until at last it makes itself invisible, or perhaps we learn to say inevitable. 
small birds, gray squirrels, all the small and alarming hurryings in the road. I wait, one passes. One dies and in dying becomes solid and heavy while sometimes one like you seems to float beyond your dying. To become a light, I imagine in the night. But you all become so soon too far from sight and we remain here, full of the dying and lost in a blizzard of grief. Um, I'm going to read a couple of birthday poems, one now, and then I'm going to close for one that I wrote for my mother a couple of years ago. Um, this is from last September when I turned, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 42. I had a funny experience. I also work in the schools working with uh, young kids to write uh, poetry. And uh, last week I was working with some second and third graders, and I asked them to create some metaphors for their, uh, for their hearts so they could talk about their feelings in a variety of ways. And in the beginning of the class, I also made the point of telling kids how old I was, because I, I like to let them know that there are this, us old people, the second graders, who uh, still like to have a good time. Um, and so this little boy got up and read his poem, and it was a very long poem in which he said his heart, when he was happy, was like a cloud floating through the sky. And uh, when he was angry, his heart was like a, a storm. And when he was sad, his heart was like a lonely 42-year-old. <laughs> And uh, I thought it was perfect, you know, he just zeroed right in on something he saw. Um, this is my poem about being just a regular old 42-year-old at 42. Goodbye poems are always a drag. They make me feel embarrassed later, ashamed of myself. I keep looking for the missing voice, the voice of your youth, and that's a mocking sound. It echoes along the walls of that oh-so-golden cave. I'm learning to laugh at myself. I hear the sauce bubbling behind me, red, like last night's tomatoes gathering in the drain, a stream like consciousness. I remember a man's voice, chastising and pristine. The water won't always be there. Don't be an ass. Turn it off between the plates. I sigh. The blues just won't recede. I'm older, too. But there's a sweetness to it, and the song of the bird's still there. Its center shifted lower. My pelvis hugs itself in joy, and lower still, where the earth opens and waits, still black with what remains. Elsewhere, water ceases to run, or runs too fast toward the middle. I, I particularly like the ending of that poem, because I have some friends who say, you know, what you, you're, you're in your 40s, you're not middle-aged yet. And my response to that always is, only if I'm lucky am I in the middle. This is a poem called Mostly Memory, which um, I wrote very recently and <coughs> really is provoked by memories of uh, playing on the streets outside of Patterson in Prospect Park where I grew up um, until the street lights went on. And there would always be that moment when the street lights would go on and then all of a sudden you'd hear some mothers calling for the kids to come home. And I was sitting in Casanova in upstate New York where I live now <coughs> and uh, that memory came to me as I was watching the trees. Um, it's called Mostly Memory. Mostly all I want, silence, the green of trees, at least a small, small breeze sailing through the pines, or nothing else but cats for pals, the music of flute and bird, and silence like a small boat on leash to blue sea. Some days I stay home alone on the porch and gaze through the screen at old familiar streets where kids play ball. Leaves flutter, it's summer, dusk and danger excite the air, then someone's mother calls, a suddenly awful sound, lonesome and fearful, invisible, like wind or footsteps. Their echoes, like memories, in the trees. I've been uh, very deeply influenced by the work of another Italian-American poet, Diane De Prima. And a few years ago, I had an opportunity to meet her. Uh, it was one of the few times I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of writers along, uh, along my travels, whose work I admired. And, um, I think, again, like Craig, I've had the experience of meeting writers whose work I admired and wish I had never met them. Um, the work was much better than, than the personality uh, behind it. Um, but in, in the case of Diane De Prima, the work and the person um, were absolutely and continue to be absolutely unified and centered, and it's a voice that, um, that just really deeply influences me. And I'm going to read a poem uh, called Dance Alone in a Bare Room. A couple of, uh, about six or eight weeks ago, I got a letter from Diane, and 
uh, in it, you know, we spent a lot of time writing letters about how we don't have time to write poetry. Um, and Diane's voice becomes for me uh, lines of poems very often, and uh, this is one that I've taken from her letter. She had had a dream she wrote me about, about watching a young man dance alone in a bare room, and as she was watching him, she thought to herself, my God, how long before we get to? So this is, dance alone in a bare room, my God, how long before we get to? My calves, milky white from a long winter, are the first to know time. Later they'll ache with the joy of it, and solitude's slow way home will remember little else. Sun streams through the south window, late afternoon, my dulcimer hangs alone near an old rough beam. In a corner, fronds of palm sway as though in summer's breeze, lazy, like the cats who linger along the sill. But still, I'm watching the motion as though I'm dreaming, sound asleep after prowling around at 3 a.m., seeking silence. Tiny light flickers near the bed, moonlight waltzing through the skylights. My lover's shoulder, the small hill it relates, the golden sheen of moon along her arm. Sometimes time is delicate, a little flower worth waiting up for. Then it's broad daylight. I'm home dreaming of dancing, but I can't lose the duet. First I read the letter, then I slide to the poem. The day is like a horse all at once, breaking into sound full gallop. Its back is all shiny with sweat. Its legs begin to ache until the sun at last goes down. Then it kicks up its heels and dances all alone, full of moonlight. <clears throat> Images of dancing show up every now and then in, uh, in my poems. Um, and this is one in which um, I have lunatics dancing in the middle of the night. It's called At 1 AM. And it has an epigram from a character that I've invented that, uh, is, that I call the Knot Mother from Patterson. And it's one of a long sequence of poems in which I'm exploring uh, the decision I made uh, many years ago to not have children and, and as I've uh, sort of reached my 40s I realize it's a decision that I'm sticking with. Um, and so it's wonderful to cre have created this persona, the not mother, because she says great things and then I get to quote her as uh, some genius who came before me. Um, it's called at 1 a.m. and the not mother says, fear is loose in the soul or whatever it is that feels. Then she says, it all happens when you least expect it. Sea, airplane, acetylcholine, and you get the light right through your fingertips. But it's rare, with other energy, sorrow, like a lamb on its way to you. Cry like a baby, you see, or say, knowing the way toward heaven inside you, round and shiny, full moon. Lunatics dance on the creaky dock at 1 a.m., girls and apricots. A loose kite, like your worst fear, is red in the beautiful sky. This is Icon, if you're not familiar with it. It's uh, one of, I think, the best magazines um, uh, being published right now in that it incorporates uh, really fine writing. Uh, of course, I'm in it, so have to be has to be wonderful. Fine writing with uh, a real sense of politics in the best sense of the word. Um, and uh, I've recently become the fiction editor of, of this particular magazine. Um, and I'm going to read a poem that was published in here um, that I wrote for an old friend of mine who I lost, as she likes to say, to the drug wars. Um, and there's a lot of drug imagery, which I'm sure a lot of people in here will, will recognize. It's called After, and it's another poem influenced by Diane de Prima from uh, a, a self-published book of hers called The Calculus of Variation. The epigram is, she ate dried apricots, third suicide era. After a certain point, all the colors are muddy. After for P.E. McGrath. Lost friend, lover wing of a bird, you float downstream, a paper boat, white, snow all winter, and alone, the fire burned, the base you created, destroyed, like all the dollars that could have brought you fluttering home. Months after silence you call, now your father has Alzheimer's, or some drunkenness has settled in the smoke of his brain, gray matter like a cloud ephemeral, full of poison and stones. All those stones we threw back into the sea our, this summer our love caught on and off. You grew sunburned and thin and surly, and I grew old and a little afraid of you. That reckless edge of danger for its own sake only, even the sexual tremor gone, only the ache it provoked, 
a need like a burning in our bellies for more, to ride white surf alone or entwined with a lover in a small blue boat as waves rocked and took us away. That night, with the mirror balanced on our knees, the mushrooms making our vision huge, we saw many things from the deck of our house. A fat moon rollicking in a deep blue sky, white-topped waves heaving up to reach it, a skunk at the door we mistook for a cat, the familiar call of love, another woman's heart you tried to yank into your mouth and left me alone with my pulse racing every time I lay down till you returned at 4 a.m. I could have cried for your breaking there like a girl, but the tide was already pulling you back, the candles fire, what we had made home, the circle between us, white with light and only ours, no longer enough or too much. Your lover does needles in a brownstone in Brooklyn like a million others and you find it unique. The final dare, a shoot of the silver dice you used to carry till you lost them somewhere in a whiteout, a final time in upstate. Or was it in Provincetown? That night our last friend fell face down and smashed the mirror. We all laughed, crawl, cruel with late August. Each of us close to the edge of dancing or falling away, eyes glassy with fear or madness, the mirror shards gleaming around her, arrow-shaped, her ragged sigh. Thirteen years ago, I dreamt these images. You as a knight, white horse mistaken for safety, and you carried me off to garden or cliff. We had to choose. The hooves of your horse made a bright, clean sound as you galloped away. The sky darkened with evening, and I stayed alone, waiting. You're vanishing now, like your father's memory. While you sit alone, waiting too, for something to save you, not the white horse, never a knight. I try to dream something else. You with your pale hands in the ground this May as it warms and opens. Your head resting on a soft belly of earth. Ears full of seeds and voices. Your arms loose and growing sunburned. Your face like that moon will remember as we eat fruit in my garden. Tossing the stones past the snow fence. Listening to the woodpecker busy with home. The sparrow brave and so small in the fiery sky. The muddy creek running fast behind the house and becoming distant, the sound of the horse taking leave. This dream becomes the other dream and I no longer believe the truth of either. What we search for, we find. Garden, cliff, the edge of death like the mud muddied face of night or any warrior after battle, after dreams turn into darkness, irretrievable as your silver dice, forever lost, for real and in memory. Angles shift in light, your voice still flutters through my sleeping dreams. Waking, I'm afraid, for both of us, for what we might find, darling, after the horse even is gone. I think today we probably all know somebody who's died of AIDS and somebody who's died of drug abuse. Um, and for me, I guess I find those, those kinds of people uh, populating my dreams a lot more than I'd like them to. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to switch gears and read a love poem. I guess that was a kind of a love poem, actually. Uh, this is the end of a sequence of uh, poems called Desire Along the Hudson, <clears throat> all of which are published in yellow silk. Um, this one's called Wild. Late at night, a bird croons. Next door, the neighbor bangs into dark. I lay alone watching stars appear and dream of love again, its soft center, my desire always fills the air with madness, especially in spring at midnight. The iris begins its urgent press against the bedroom's wall. The sound of love is rushing in the creek. Out back, my old dog's spirit calls for a stroll. Stars keep appearing brighter and brighter, almost harsh with their gleaming, and you, my secret, only a dream, are wild and sparkle where the minnows run, flushed by the moon. I swim and swim all night, in dark and silky water. I'm going to read a couple of, um, well, actually, before I read some of the Not Mother poems, I'm going to read a poem. One of the things that I like to do is work from the newspaper um, and write about people that uh, I don't know but uh, who I have great affinity for. And a couple of years ago, I was reading um, the paper and read about a young girl in uh, Brooklyn uh, named Waikisha Bolden, who was 11 years old and uh, who was fatally shot when two men argued on the street. It's called Still Life in Person, and it begins with a quote from the newspaper. Quote, 
Waikisha Bolden, who couldn't have been a sweeter girl, died from massive bleeding after being shot in the back while two men fought over a personal matter, end quote. Waikisha Bolden's 11-year-old personal life stopped running sweet like the juice of a plum and fell instead into the big, angry mouth of the street while two men argued over a personal matter. Maybe it was raining, an end of summer rain as the hot last smell of raindrops fell on the smoldering pavement. And maybe the waning harvest moon sent its own saddening light onto where Waikisha Bolden lay alone, still as stone, while two men, their mouths now open wide with shame, collapsed at last as well. Nothing mattering over all those plum sweet girls dropping in their paths who stopped seeming real. The rain froze into winter. The street turned slick with wanting. And headlights glimmered a little, then went on into the still and personal life of the night. <clears throat> um, several years ago, also, I had uh, I was I had an opportunity to be at uh, the art colony in uh, at Malay, which is down in Austerlitz, New York. And <clears throat> one night I was there, and I was about to go to sleep, and I started to have this image of. Uh, a man that I've never seen in my life coming up a, cellar, a set of cellar steps that I've never encountered in my life except in this uh, particular sort of waking dream. And I thought, well, that's just crazy. Just go back to sleep. Yeah, this guy would not leave. So I realized there was a poem um, emerging. And uh, I always like to say when I read this poem, very, as far as I know, this is uh, a totally, I guess you could say, found poem from someplace inside of my own uh, cosmology or image making. Um, it's called Anniversary. Never mind the moments when the sky goes dark with his refusal to speak. Never mind the sound of his saw whirring down cellar all evening. Upstairs you stir the gravy, whisper a novena, and finger beads while the kitchen grows warm with your feeling. All the time you're thinking this is what it comes to, the buzzing of the blade and the damp and musty insides of the house, a place of silence and no mystery. When you run out of beads on the rosary, your patience snaps like a bone bent backward the angle at last or natural. His steps up the stairs sound ridiculous, stubborn as stone. He pokes his way toward the kitchen and you see how his bald head has a dull sheen like a candled egg. And you go with your wooden spoon, crack, crack, on the stovetop, imagining. I'm going to read uh, some of the poems from um, the sequence that I call Ifs for the Not Mother from Patterson. Um, and the first one is called Ifs for the Not Mother. <coughs> Excuse me. Already large and prone to swell, mid cycle when the birds harping at the window made an insa insane sound in your heart. At the moment of giving up, maybe there was the sound of ocean, heartbeat. And later in the blackness, when your swirling sought stars, only stars in the heavy blue sky, you swept the galaxy like a used-to-be broom on linoleum. And a hearty hard laugh to you, too, for that one. What used to be broom, not mother, big knockers, and that so round belly, not, after all, a mound of sorrow behind you. The silk mills closed before I was born. The key was missing from the sunlight. I got lost in the limbo I saw like bodiless heads in blue sky. The torsos of pleasure below where sin lived. And heaven where the rich rose to the tops of clouds like a hilltop and gleamed out through yellow shutters at the incompletes. So my sentences will always dangle, remain unfinished, the leftover sound just floating in the air between dreamers. One day I open an old book and a song starts late at night in the same language I never heard before. My heart burns with the desire, just the desire. And <clears throat> Blood Dreamer is another one of these. I'm going to read two of the other Not Mother poems. <clears throat> um, both of these poems are going to be out in, or out right now, I guess, in a new magazine out of Purdue called Voices in Italian Americana. And um, all my life, people have said to me, all my adult life, I guess, when both my young adult life and my old adult life, um, gee, you know, why don't you have kids? You, you know, why don't you have kids? Or why don't you have kids? And I always try to figure out what is it they were seeing. And um, I guess I assumed because I was Italian, you know, maybe that had something to do with it. People just assume all Italians have to have a lot of kids or something. So I thought it was particularly interesting that of all the work I sent to Voices in Italian Americana, these were the poems they selected. Um, so maybe it keeps going on and on. Um, but this is one of the first in the sequence, and it's in two parts. Blood Dreamer, one. 
Dog at her side, breasts heavy with love, she leans and fills the, fills the fire with sorrow. Soft ashes make at first a comforting sound as she moves them, the stick poking, poking, until an ember catches the stick. For a moment, the light is heavy, orange, like a sunset's flame along the beach. Lovers' tongues like little fires, a memory. As though she is old, the dog's muzzle is gray. She lounges with her ankles crossed on the grass. The lap lap of the water makes a heavy sound along the slatted pier. She can see from the mouth of the cave at moonlight. She raises her legs, blood passes, small river without love and red with dreaming. Like the sunrise at lakeside, the last morning she appeared. Two. Sugar tooth, craving for a sweet tit, end of the cycle, belly flat again, and it begins. The yearning, slow ache like a toothache, like something big at the top of a hill, just beginning to consider rolling all over again. And grass like Celia waves, a small symphony of waves, blue music, while the birds sang once in a cloud of magic. Behind the puffy surface, something happens. All the time, a slow roll of pleasure, like the winging of another span, and you could die laughing in it, the whole time sucking on your sweet tooth while your breasts swell, a little wave, like farewell, or like a welcome. Um, I want to say something. A lot of times when I read these poems, people say to me later, gee, they seem so sad, you know. They are not sad to me at all. They're um, sort of a, a, a series of poems in which I really am exploring both physically because physically, um, I feel the body being very aware of decisions, whether it's to have children or to have sex or to have something to eat. Um, and I just, I find it very interesting to explore all of those sensations. So I just want to say that because the next one um, is again another De Prima influenced poem. I wrote it in a workshop she offered a couple of years ago. It's called Feather Scale Egg. And at the beginning, the, the knot mother says, the knot mother sees herself as a child of the past. Feather Scale Egg. Old feather floating downstream from the time the sky opened. Blue notes, white feathers, and so many stones slippery with moss. Skipping stones, one, two, three leaps of the flat-bellied stones on the way across the lake, or they sink fast like stones to the deep. A fish, a bird, scales and feathers all shiny with light. Blood courses through my belly on its way out. An egg falls into the center of the dark from either side. The fish, the bird, and I have a wild eye and eggs gleaming with love. The knot mother unties hope from the burning stake. Shh, hear the moan. It's the fire burning, the wing of a bird slicing through blue air, the fish finning towards sea, or me opening to the losses. And I'm going to close with a poem that I wrote two years ago for my mother on her birthday, on my birthday rather. Um, and again, it was a time that I was away at this um, writer's colony and uh, could not receive phone calls. At certain times, I felt the writer's colony, which I've, I don't know if anybody's had the experience, but there were times when I was at this place where I felt like the word colony was really appropriate, you know, as in penal colony. Um, it, it struck me as particularly odd that we weren't, we weren't permitted to get phone calls. You know, you had to do all this sort of stuff to get through. There was a little bit of, um, I think, elitism maybe attached to being at this place. Nonetheless, I got a lot of work accomplished there. And one of them was this poem that uh, I wrote for my mother. It was my 40th birthday, and I had to call my mother so she could wish me a happy birthday. Um, and this is a uh, 40th birthday poem f to myself, my own birthday, but to my mother. Mama, your voice on the telephone, a little hoarse and fast and full of New Jersey. Sounds like the way a friend describes mine. Raspy, she says, and fast talking. This morning, when I call you on my 40th birthday, I hear us together drinking coffee and bitching about pop. He's cranky, you say, I ask more than usual. He's out when I call, so you talk freely, and I miss the mornings we'd spend in the kitchen. The sound of your voice floats through my dreams, and when I wake today, Mama, I'm using it. This is one of the things I like about getting older, the way I'm more like you or my memory of you with every year I gather. And they seem to come faster now. Between us, 104 years make a V in the sky like a migration of birds. Today, I light the candle and make the wish. Wherever we land, may we find a little kitchen, brew some coffee, and lend the blue echo of our voices matched at last to all the birds still singing. Thank you. <laughs>